On today's episode of What's Going On with Shipping, a convoy battle erupted in the Red Sea. I'm your host, Sal Mercogliano. Welcome to today's episode. So on January 9th, 2024, U.S. Central Command, along with the British Ministry of Defense, have issued releases talking about a protracted battle in the Southern Red Sea waged by U.S. Navy destroyers, a Royal Navy destroyer, and aircraft off the aircraft carrier USS Eisenhower. I have received information from multiple sources who were sailing in the area. I want to convey that to you, talk a little bit about the situation that has transpired here, and also some interesting developments regarding Iran and China. All of this is, is playing out right now as we speak. If you're new to the channel, hey, take a moment, subscribe to the channel and hit the bell so you alert about new videos as they come out. All right, we've been using the analogy of Tom Hanks here a while. The commercial ships coming under fire, that is the Captain Phillips element here. But what we saw transpire on January 9th was more greyhoundish. This was the U.S. Navy and the Royal Navy fighting through. Now, we didn't have a World War II style convoy going through, as you see in Greyhound. Instead, what we saw was the U.S. Navy and the Royal Navy establishing kind of gatekeepers, a picket fence of destroyers on the eastern side of the channel between the main shipping channel and the Houthi in Yemen. Obviously, what for, or fortunately, what never happened is none of the crews wound up cast away. So that is the key thing. All right, we're done with our Tom Hanks analogy. Let's jump into this. So this is a story over at G Captain John Conrad. Groundhog Day, World War II combat tactics return to the Red Sea. What makes this attack really interesting is both Central Command and the Ministry of Defense said it in their notes. This is the Central Command post. At January 9th, at approximately 9.15 local time, Iranian-backed Houthis launched a complex, and the phrase to look at there is complex. Haven't seen that word used. That tells me this is one of two things. Either a swarm attack where they tried to overwhelm uh, the defenses, or what this actually sounds like is they tried to spread out the defenses and try to get some leakers through, get past the wall launched a complex attack of Iranian-designed one-way attack UAVs, what they're calling OWA UAVs. Military loves acronyms. This is basically a propeller-driven missile is what it is. It's, it's not a rocket-fired missile, so it's a propeller-driven kamikaze. Anti-ship cruise missiles and an anti-ship ballistic missiles from Houthi-controlled areas of Yemen. The details. 18 uh, one-way uh, UAVs, two anti-ship cruise missiles, and an anti-ship ballistic missile were shot down by the combined efforts of the F-18s from the Dwight David Eisenhower, this is the carrier battle group in the Red Sea, and three U.S. destroyers, the Gravely, the Laboon, and the Mason, and the United Kingdom's Type 45 destroyer, Diamond. This is the 26th Houthi attack on commercial shipping since November 19th. No injuries or damages. Uh, it goes back to the statement issued on, on January 3rd. The Houthis will bear the responsibility for the consequences should they continue to threaten lives, the global economy, or the free flow of commerce in the region's critical waterways. This is the Ministry of Defense statement. Overnight, HMS Diamond, along with U.S. warships, successfully repelled the largest attack from the Iranian-backed Houthi in the Red Sea. During Sea Viper's Missiles and guns, uh, dirt deploying Sea Viper missiles and guns, Diamond destroyed multiple attack drones heading for her and commercial shipping in the area with no injuries. The UK alongside allies have previously made clear that these illegal attacks are completely unacceptable. We'll take action needed to protect innocent lives in the global economy. All right. Why on January 9th was this attack launched? I believe I know. And that has to do with the fact that four U.S. vessels traverse the area. Four vessels, U.S. flagged, were waiting and holding in the area, waiting to come through. One of them was the Maersk Atlanta. This is a ship of Maersk Line Limited, part of the Maritime Security Program. It had been sitting in the area for a few days. It had come through the Suez Canal, then turned off its AIS and was sitting here in the Central Red Sea for several days. Other vessels included the car carriers Green Bay of Waterman Steamship and the Alliance Norfolk. Uh, this is a ship of, uh, uh, of also operated by Maersk Lines, the Alliance Norfolk, was a ship of Liberty uh, Maritime, Liberty Glory, which is a bulker. This ship is carrying USAID grain from Corpus Christi down to Djibouti. And that ship had been sitting there since December 31st. It had been there a protracted 
long period of time. All four of these ships disappeared, turned off their AISs by yesterday, and some of the ships have now appeared. Liberty Glory, uh, Green Bay, and Maersk Atlanta are all sitting down in Djibouti right now uh, on scene. So that seems to be the focus here of the attack. Uh, I want to show you some other information that I think is really telling. This is the Iranian cargo ship Bashad. And one of the things that you'll see here, this is an Iranian cargo vessel, but this vessel has been operating in and around the Red Sea. You'll notice it sailed from Iran on June 18th of 2021 and is not due to go back until January 22nd of 2024. These are two Iranian ports. This ship is a base ship. It's being used by the Iranians to monitor the area. And one of the things we heard is that a lot of the attacks took place in this region right here, the very southern end of the Red Sea. I'm going to play uh, marine traffic to show you what this vessel was doing. So this is marine traffic. You're not going to see any of those U.S. vessels identified because many ships are turning off their AIS. Other vessels have their AIS on. This is Bashad right here. I'm going to go ahead and let this play. And you'll notice it's sitting there and it gets underway. This is 9 January. This is about 1800 UTC time. So uh, Sanaa time, the time in the Red Sea is about two to three hours ahead, depending on what they're doing. You'll notice that the ships are following a track here. Most of the ships heading northbound following a track. Most of the ships heading southbound following a track. But notice Bashad, it is just going back and forth in this area. Pretty clear that this Iranian vessel was spotting for the Houthi. Uh, it is, there's no other reason for a ship like this to be just patrolling back and forth as a general cargo ship. Uh, this is an area where the ships come the closest to Yemen right here because of the way the navigation channel is. I popped on the navigation chart there. You'll see that there is a uh, traffic separation scheme right here. The deepest part of the channel is right here. And what we're seeing is probably the spotting of vessels. You can't really get too far out of the channel here because of the nature of the channel. And I think that is very indicative of what's happening. It's very clear that Bashad is sitting here just doing nothing but spotting for them. I do want to show you something else, too. We believe that the U.S. Navy and the, the British destroyers were in this line right here. Inshore of the main channel, they were providing the kind of the gatekeepers for this. But you'll notice two clusters of vessels, and this is outside. Over here, this is the uh, point where shipping coming from Asia and coming from the Persian Gulf come together. And you'll notice a little blue vessel in here. And then same thing up the Red Sea, you'll notice a cluster of vessels all in here. And there's a couple of uh, light-colored blue vessels in here. This is the point where vessels will take on board their armed guard detachments. Uh, companies like Ambry and a few others provide armed guard detachments. And what vessels will do is they'll stop here at this, at, this, at this security vessel. This is kind of an offshore vessel. They'll embark an armed security detachment with personnel on board. You'll see many vessels will show that they have armed guards on board. That seems to be one of the big things that we're seeing right now are these armed guards on board. They will ride through this area, and then when they come up here, they will offload them. And then those crews will go on those, uh, uh, those offshore vessels and then embark on other vessels so that they're basically riding back and forth here. Now, armed guards are great for providing defense against small vessels. They are, don't provide much defense at all against ballistic and uh, anti-ship cruise missiles. May be able to provide some assistance against drones, but again, it, it's really spotty whether or not they can do that. So one of the things that this channel provides for me is access to firsthand experience. And I received notes, text, WhatsApps from a variety of mariners who sailed through the event yesterday. And while I can't disclose who they are and where they're from for fear that the companies would, would come against them, I want to share some observations that I received from you. And you're going to have to take my word for it. I apologize. But I, I, just, I, I won't release their names for obvious reasons reasons. Uh, a couple of comments uh, that came in that I thought was, was really interesting was one that basically described the events as unreal. Uh, it really was 
uh, very greyhound. I had mentioned this to one uh, mariner. I said, I heard you had a very greyhound day referencing the Tom Hanks movie. And he goes, it certainly was. But one of the things that stood out was this. Uh, uh, it was a greyhound day for sure. And when the shots started coming in fast, the Brits, this is HMS Diamond, got on the radio and told all ships to increase to max speed. Uh, the biggest problem we have is that our ships do not have the comms gear to talk to the Navy. Uh, this is a systematic problem I've heard from multiple sources, that one of the problems the Navy did not do for some reason was embark uh, groups on board with secure communication. So in the case of the U.S. Navy, uh, U.S. commercial vessels, for example, there should have been a rider on board with a secure communication to do it. Instead, they were communicating either via VHF or through uh, satellite phones. But that required them to contact, uh, have the right satellite phones. You can only do one-to-one -one communication that way. Not exactly the best way to communicate. Uh, let me pull up another here. Uh, based on the con uh, communication they had uh, from the uh, British destroyer, they were told to increase to maximum speed to avoid the attack. Uh, I, I do want to read this section because I think this one from this email is really interesting. Uh, after the first sighting of intercept missiles fired from U.S. destroyers and subsequent successful intercept explosions, the coalition warships conducted the contacted the vessel and advised us to increase to maximum speed. The total duration of the attacks that we witnessed was spread over a three-hour period, but most of the activity occurred for about 30 minutes around Mocha. That's the area where the Iranian base ship was located. That base ship, by the way, has, has been there for a long time, as I mentioned. The Navy ships did not escort us. They were more spread out along our route between the vessel and the Yemeni coast, providing what we call overwatch. We could see multiple launches from those vessels north and south of us during that time. Uh, it goes on. There are some other ones here that talked about the dramatic nature of watching the launches and seeing the destruction of the uh, drones as they went on. Three hours is a long time to be under this. Remember, these are commercial vessels with no defenses at all. Many of these crews, both foreign crews and American crews, are doing this with no compensation beyond the normal pay. Uh, most companies and uh, maritime organizations and unions have not deemed this a war risk zone. And so therefore, they're not getting paid anything extra for this, even though this is dangerous. And there's a note here that I think is really interesting in this, in this uh, one video, he, uh, one, excuse me, uh, email. The uh, mariner on board says this, not trying to be dramatic, but after witnessing the multiple airborne intercepts during last night's attack and hearing the calls from other ships on the radio having similar close proximity intercepts, I can tell you that this threat is real. I, I, I don't know what more to say than that. that the U.S. and the British Navy have to counter. You literally have to go back to the tanker wars of the late 80s to find a concentrated effort to attack commercial vessels thwarted by uh, U.S. And, and, and Royal Navy destroyer. So you've got the Houthi launching a myriad of attacks. You've got an Iranian base ship steaming back and forth in the area, pro obviously communicating, providing targeting information to the Houthi. And then you have this, which I think is another interesting thing. This was a, uh, uh, a squawk being done by a uh, Chinese uh, vessel. This is the Costco uh, Sheng, uh, uh, Shengjia that was steaming through the area. And what you want to notice on here is the place it says. The place says Chinese company. Uh, a lot of ships are identifying themselves associated with China. And to me, this is a very telling issue right now. If being associated with China gets you protection, then, and if the U.S. Navy and the Allied navies under Prosperity Guardian cannot provide the protection, now they have. Now, the Navy's done a fantastic job. Uh, we, we have not seen ships hit. But sooner or later, you can't have a 100% success rate. Uh, sooner or later, ships are going to get hit. But if the Chinese can provide protection, not so much with their Navy, the 45th Escort Group that's in the area that hasn't done anything except put out a promotional video, but if just saying you're connected to the Chinese is enough, then do ocean carriers sit there and start flagging their ships under the Chinese flag? And you start seeing a flight to the flag. 
This is an asymmetric style of warfare we have not seen in ocean shipping in a long time. The Houthi, a non-state player, is engaging naval forces in a complex manner, to quote the Central Command. Commercial vessels are forced to maneuver and avoid attacks. You have a, another third-party state, the Iranians here, with a spy vessel basically communicating information to the Houthi. You have private security agencies being used to provide some sort of defense on the vessels close aboard, while at the same time you have a piracy issue out in the Gulf of Aden in the Arabian Sea being perpetrated, we think, by Somalis, but probably backed closer to the Houthis. You have Iranians attacking vessels up in the Arabian Sea. Two ships so, so far have been attacked. And now you have China making a move here to potentially start seeing a reflagging effort coming in. This is a lot. This is a lot for a Red Sea attack, and I'm not sure everyone's getting this in the mainstream news. So I wanted to convey this to you. A lot of information in the process. I probably missed a lot, and I apologize, but it's just a lot to digest right now. I'll be looking at more information, looking for more information coming in. If you want to send me information, again, down in the show notes, you'll see ways to contact me via Twitter, uh, via, via Facebook, and via uh, email. Feel free to do it. I will send you a link. So if you want to communicate securely, we can do that. But there is a lot going on here for the mariners, for global shipping, for ocean shipping. And this style of attack is not going to convince the big ocean carriers, especially the container liners, to come back anytime soon. The insurance companies are going to sit there and say, yes, you did a great job. No ship got hit. But man, that's a lot to defend against. And that's depending on the U.S. and the Royal Navy providing that protection with a carrier. It's not clear that that same level of protection is going to be continued going forth. The U.S. can do this forever, but the, the question isn't the military stamina, it's the political stamina. Do we have the political stamina to continue with this? Hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you did, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, and hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. Leave a comment, share it across social media, give it a big thumbs up, and if you can, support the page. How do you do that? You get the super thanks button down below or head on over to Patreon and become a monthly, yearly subscriber. Till our next Red Sea story, it seems. Sal, signing off.